I'm very uh, happy to be here with Franco, uh, my good friend, Franco Bifo Berardi from Bologna. We're so grateful to everybody at the Museo del Chopo for inviting us, uh, Pacho, Francisco, and everybody on the team who's made this video possible. So thank you for having us. Yeah, Franco and I have been friends for quite some time. We've, uh, I've been very lucky to work with him on a few texts and even to hang out in Bologna and talk about various histories and presents and futures. So uh, today we decided to meet uh, and actually continue a conversation that we began last March about the situation globally with COVID uh, in very specific terms and also in very broad terms. So we'll, we'll go back and forth between them. But Franco, thanks so much for being here with me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to be in Mexico City. Always it's a pleasure for me to be in Mexico, virtually or physically. Better physically, I mean, but. I really wish it was physically, but. Um, so I guess I'll start with the question I actually wrote because I was rereading our conversation from last March. Uh, and in last March, I asked you this question. I said, what do you see as the horizon of possibility at a time like this? when certain biopowers and tactics of modern social control age and grow obsolete, and the reaction to save them grows still more violent. So it's been almost a year since we had that conversation. And you responded with a lot of different thoughts, all of them very interesting. Uh, but one in particular seems to have resonated with what continued this last year. You said, all of a sudden, the pandemic has reactivated the future as a space of possibility because the automatisms that disabled political subjectivity in the past neoliberal decades have been broken or at least destabilized. So I'm gonna reiterate my question, uh, hoping that it's neither tragic nor farcical uh, and say, what do you see as the horizon of possibility at a time like this? And how do you think that horizon changed over the last year? It's interesting the opportunity, the possibility of uh, uh, rethinking, uh, reassessing uh, uh, what we said uh, almost one year ago, at the beginning of the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, I had the intuition that the pandemic was, as you say before, was reopening the game. And uh, actually, the game is open, is as open as uh, we can never, we could never imagine in the past. Uh, but uh, when the game is open, uh, uh, things happen and uh, the landscape uh, is changing at, uh, at, every, at every moment. So what now? I like the idea of talking about this uh, ever-changing situation, but at the same time, I am a little bit uh, uh, shy or uh, frightened by the possibility of having uh, a bad effect on those who are listening. I know what I say is not that important. I do not want to, uh, but uh, if uh, just one person, a friend, a comrade, someone like you, Andreas, huh? a friend and a comrade uh, and a young person, if uh, what I say can be, can have a depressive effect of someone like you, I, 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 I think that I am wrong. I, I don't want to do that. So please let me be crazy, but do not follow me. Hmm? One year ago, we said, uh, the game is reopened. The game still is open, but in today we are going through 
a, a, a face of extreme danger. I, I want to use a metaphor to say it. I would say that the news is tightening around the neck of the humankind. What is the news? The news of absolute capitalism, of neoliberal absolute capitalism. Let's look at what is happening in two in two domains of uh, uh, social life, of the planetary becoming. One is communication, and the other is uh, bio, uh, the, the bio uh, dimension, the, the, um, the sanitary dimension, and the possibility for human life to go on. Uh, we, have, I have the impression that on those two domains, our neck, our neck is taken in the nose of financial capitalism. Look at what is happening at the level of the vaccine. How do you say in English vaccine or vaccine? Vaccine. Huh? Uh, la vacuna. La vacuna. Uh, 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 the European states, I want to speak about the European situation. Uh, Europe has paid, has financed big corporations like Pfizer to produce the vaccine for the European population. Why do we need a private corporation for to for to for doing that, but it's obvious because in the last 10, 20 years, uh, the European uh, states have destroyed, uh, have definanced the school, the medicine faculties, the research, the public uh, health, and so on and so on. So we entered the, in the pandemic without a sanitary mask without uh, medics, doctors, um, without the possibility of a public intervention. So we went to Pfizer and similar corporations. Now uh, we have paid, I mean, the the, the public uh, uh, organization, the, the, the uh, at paid for this uh, for the development of the vaccine and now the vaccine is ready and we must pay to buy the vaccine we pay before we pay after but Pfizer decided the agreement with the European Union can be broken because they want to sell their vaccine to different uh, buyers who pay more than uh, uh, Europe. Israeli is paying $28 for every dose. And the Israeli state up to now is not giving to Palestinians in the territories the possibility of getting the vaccine. Let me say that this is horrible. I don't say more. Uh, so we have, we, our neck is taken in the news of the privatization of, of everything. Privatization of uh, uh, health, privatization of research and so on and so on. The same is happening in the field of communication. Just two weeks ago, we discovered that the president of the United States, whose name was Donald Trump, a criminal, a fascist, a pig, has been forbidden to use his Twitter account. Is it good? Is it bad? Please, let's remember that Mr. Dorsey was very friendly with Donald Trump as long as Donald Trump was a winner. 
Donald Trump has been allowed to do whatever he wanted before, when he was threatening uh, people in the street, when he was insulting black people or Muslim people, Jack Dorsey was friendly with him. When Donald Trump changed his position and turned a loser, at that point, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and so on decided that he was out of the game. This is very dangerous because the majority of our discourse, of our uh, talk, uh, is going through Zoom, like uh, now, through Facebook, through Twitter, through Google, and so on. That means that we have put our neck inside the news of big corporation. That is my description of the situation. And the pandemic has created a situation in which the news is tightening and tightening because we are totally, what can we do when Pfizer is uh, saying uh, uh, this is the vaccine and uh, we will not give you the vaccine you don't pay more and so on that is the situation it's not a situation without escape because chaos is the king that is the point and uh, chaos uh, chaos is uh, an enemy, but he is also a friend. Sometimes chaos is a friend. So my point now is that we must not be frightened by chaos. We must not wage war against chaos. Those who wage war against chaos will be defeated because chaos feeds upon war. So let's think about the possibility that in the chaotic situation, we cannot find for, for friendship and for, and for the good of society. I think that, that the last point you said is, is perfect, um, uh, that chaos is... Um, an enemy, but it's also our friend, because it gets at this double nature that so many comments you just raised um, bring up, right? Like in the case of occupied Palestine, the, the, the party who is doing the colonizing is also the party that is refusing sanitary aid, right? I mean, the, the example I can draw in the States, and I forget which state this is, but um, a state in the Midwest of the so-called United States declared meat packers essential workers so that everybody can continue to eat meat, um, even though they had one of the highest incidences of COVID transmission. But it's only when the vaccine comes around that that same governor says they're not essential enough for the vaccine. They don't deserve it, but they must continue to go to work, right? And this is this thing that uh, we, we were talking about that um, we can critique the, the, the notion of biopolitics all we want, but uh, it has never been more apparent than in a moment like this, where the crisis, the sanitary crisis is met with the neoliberal crisis, right? Um, similarly, uh, in the United States, as you're describing in Europe, public health care, what little existed has been utterly dismantled. I mean, just in New York City, where I live, we've lost 20,000 hospital beds in uh, 20 years, which would have come in handy. But we also have a $6 billion police budget that has only been enforced throughout the last years. Um, on, the, on the notion of, of, of uh, chaos, both uh, being a space of possibility and a space of restraint, uh, I'm going to refer back to our conversation once more. Um, and I'm thinking here of something like the burning down of the third police precinct in Minneapolis. Um, I bring up that example um, not only because it inspired hope uh, all over the states and also elsewhere. I remember last week reading a letter from a Russian anarchist saying after the protests in Moscow how they were inspired by the burning down of this police precinct. But more importantly, 
that in a poll conducted after they burned down the police station, 53% of Americans who were polled expressed support for that action. Meaning that in general, if there is a sense of extolling nonviolence, violence can also be accepted uh, when it is necessary. Um, and so we talked last year about how um, the COVID pandemic followed what you called um, the rebellions uh, of 2019. These, the uprisings of 2019. And you said that uh, the global revolt that erupted in 2019 was a sort of convulsion of the worldwide social body. These different rebellions were not able to find a common strategy, for now at least. So the convulsion re resulted in a collapse. But now we are in something like a paralysis that follows collapse. So if that paralysis followed collapse, can I ask what you think followed paralysis? And I'm referring here to um, the riots in Naples on October, in October, uh, in Haiti, the incredible uh, insurrections and rebellions happening in India, in Russia, in Thailand, uh, all throughout the so-called United States. So if we are to keep that train, convulsion, collapse, paralysis, what comes next? The word convulsion is, um... My opinion is um, is explaining much of um, of our condition. What is a convulsion? Convulsion is a involuntary reaction, unconscious reaction, of a body which is on the brink of suffocation, on the brink of uh, uh, death, uh, and actually the social body has been pushed to the brink of, uh, a, a, of suffocation. The, the metaphor of breathing here is, uh, is really, uh, if, you, if you suffocate, uh, your brain is losing uh, the ability of uh, uh, of uh, thinking, uh, of elaborating a strategy. So a convulsion is uh, in, a, in not totally conscious reaction of uh, a body uh, on, the, on the brink of suffocation. And uh, in a sense, this is what uh, has happened in the world uh, in the fall 2019. I do not deny that many of the people who have taken to the streets in November, December of 19 were perfectly conscious of what they, they were doing. Think of Chile, for instance. Santiago de Chile, the cities of Chile have been full of people for three months uh, and still are full of people because the Chilean people are fighting are going, and they were quite conscious of the problem, rewriting the constitution, canceling the Nazi constitution of Pinochet, which was a neoliberal constitution. Chile is the place where a, we can understand what has happened in the last 40 years. 11, September 11, 1973 has been the beginning of our time. Uh, one, because uh, a Nazist, Augusto Pinochet, has destroyed the democracy, has killed 30,000 people, uh, and so on and so on. But Nazism and neoliberal reform have been totally integrated. The, who was uh, uh, behind Augusto Pinochet? Henry Kissinger, the, the Chicago boys of the neoliberal uh, strategy, and so on. So a Nazi liberal regime has been imposed with the force and 
the, the Chilean population in, in 19 were totally conscious that uh, their problem was coming out of the neoliberal Nazis constitution. And so many other people in Paris, in Hong Kong, in, in Barcelona, in Quito, in La Paz, have been fighting conscious, consciously. But the general process was essentially chaotic. Uh, uh, and it's not, uh, it's not uh, meaningless uh, that uh, in those days uh, many young people were wearing uh, the mask uh, of the Joker. The, the movie by Philip Todd, uh, you can like it or not, but is very interesting as a political interpretation of the contemporary suffering the majority of people are suffering in the effects of 40 years of destruction of every social solidarity. So neoliberalism has been production of suffering, of craziness, of anguish, uh, of misery, of depression. This is essentially, and that condition is not good for the strategical thought. That is the point. So we have to live inside the riots. We have to be part of the revolt. But at the same time, we have to be conscious of the fact that inside the revolt, uh, something is lacking. <laughs> what is lacking? Uh, a, a strategical view. I know that. Um, I am an old person, so probably I, I see things uh, in an old uh, way, um, strategy, and uh, um, maybe, maybe that uh, the point is no more to, uh, to imagine a conscious, strategical avant-garde. It's no more the point, but the point is when, how, will we, the majority of the population, the workers, uh, the women, the people who are oppressed and exploited, when will they be able to create a form which is able to go beyond the, the neoliberal uh, uh, capitalist absolutes? That, that is the point. How can we come out from this trap. And the convulsion is not enough. That is the point. So pandemic, a pandemic condition it has been, up to a certain point, the possibility of clearly understanding uh, what is the enemy. <laughs> the, the enemy is the privatization of everything, is the capital dictatorship that destroys all kind, every kind of solidarity. Understanding that is, has been important, but it's not enough because now we have to understand something more. What is the new form that can take shape somewhere in, in maybe in a proliferating way? Uh, this is why I say conversion. Then comes the collapse. The pandemic has been the collapse. The collapse has provoked a sort of uh, stop, of uh, deflation. All of a sudden, the acceleration has stopped and the rhythm has slowed. For a while, for many days, months, we have been listening to the silence, looking for a possibility of new social solidarity. But now, now I see that the forces of the neoliberal dictatorship are back and are crying to 
take the upper hand once more. That is the, the situation in which uh, we are now. It's incredible how much the, the, the neoliberal uh, uh, ideology, the neoliberal discourse uh, is reproposing itself. After all the destruction it has provoked, it's coming back. It's coming back. Why is it coming back? Because we are unable to, to escape the trap. Because we are unable to create another imagination of our future. That is the point. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a lot there, again, that feeds into each other and creates something like a picture. Um, the first one, I, I think your, desc your description of how fascism and neoliberalism work together is incredibly valid. Um, there's a group called Research and Destroy, and they put out a text some years ago when Trump was elected uh, calling him a fascist without fascism. So a Mussolini without his Italy, right? Um, and I think the Capitol, the events at the United States Capitol a few weeks ago attest to that. Um, and on the question of, of what is to be done, I, I really like um, how Idris Robinson reformulated uh, Lenin's fam famous phrase to instead say, to, to speak on the insurrections this summer, to instead say how it might should be done, meaning there are available forms and they maybe perhaps shouldn't be organized in, in a way that you're describing. The question of organization is, is really complicated. But I think, I think you're right. Um, I think there's a difference between uh, let's say Western Europe, where there's been some pretty strict lockdown restrictions, right? Uh, sometimes telling you that you can only leave within one kilometer of your house. And if you do, then uh, you receive hefty fines. In the States, there have been no such things. There have been recommendations that are not enforced. Meanwhile, they're enforcing other regimes of control. So undocumented people are still uh, harassed. Uh, people of color are still killed by the police. But there's n there hasn't been this sort of a using of the sanitary system to, 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 to really enforce that, at least not the same I guess has been in Europe. And I think because of that, it hasn't really felt like a stop uh, here at least. You know, like American production only fell by 5% last year, which considering the way we talked about the crisis is, is quite uh, astounding. I mean, 5% is a lot, but it's still pretty astounding. Um, I guess about this, um, changes that you're noticing. Uh, you were very uh, generous and shared a text with me that you're writing, which we're going to talk about because the text itself is very interesting. But just on this topic, I wanted to remind you something you said, which I think is very interesting. Um, you said, the left has identified itself, and I know that you don't like the term left. The left has identified itself with those who play by the rules, who keep their distance, who behave themselves. There is a comedy role exchange whereby fascists are the defenders of freedom and progressives are the defenders of the law. This too signals the dissolution of the 20th century political landscape. I hope that's an okay translation. I translated it very quickly last night. But to say there has been this switch. And I think one place where we can talk about that is uh, what happened at the US Capitol in, uh, it, on January 6th which you described as the center of the American abyss. We could also talk about it, about the far right riots that happened in the Netherlands last week, but which were um, uh, joined by, by migrant youth who definitely uh, should not be put in the same camp uh, as, um, yeah, as, as the people who are organizing these, these violence. I'm trying to find a quote by a guy named Peter Gelderloos, an anti-fascist researcher who says uh, something that I think resonates with your quote very well. He said, our history shows us it is never a good idea to let the right monopolize social conflict. Have we already forgotten Ukraine? Um, and so he tells us that we need to maybe not think about forms, but think about how we can intervene in these, as you describe them, organic insurrections that are responses to either a deceleration in one place or an acceleration of other violence on the other. So can you maybe, before we talk about your uh, amazing COVID inquiry uh, survey, can you tell us uh, what you mean by this comedy role exchange, whereby fascists are defenders of freedom and progressives are defenders of the law, as you say? 
that is a, an interesting but very complicated subject because in this uh, change of the roles in the comedy, uh, you can see one, the uh, problematization of the concept of freedom, one. Second, the trap in which subjectivity is taken at the present. A, a writer that I like very much, whose name is Jonathan Franden, wrote, uh, among many other books, wrote a book titled Freedom, in which he says, um, uh, people came to this country, America, uh, um, looking for two things, money and freedom. But only few got money. So the majority of them, of those people who came to that country, uh, the majority uh, not gaining money enough, uh, uh, green clinged, grasped desperately to freedom. Freedom of what? What is the freedom of a, a North American proletarian? Freedom of uh, uh, having a gun? Freedom of beating his wife? Freedom uh, of being uh, desperate and, and fixed uh, with fentanyl, this is a freedom. The problem is that uh, we have entered, uh, we, I mean me and you, and uh, the, the left, the intellectuals, uh, the modern intelligentsia has accepted the word freedom without critique, without understanding what is the meaning of that. If I am allowed to be for two minutes uh, uh, the philosopher that I am not, uh, I would quote Spinoza in this case. And I would say that the problem is not freedom. The real problem is potency. We the romantic culture has put freedom on the top of everything. And uh, so we have uh, uh, imagined uh, that uh, being free means uh, to do whatever we like uh, to do, killing people, colonizing uh, uh, the miserable South, and so on and so on. But the problem is uh, that we are free to do only what uh, we have the potency to do. If I want to be free of uh, jumping down from the uh, skyscraper and uh, fly, that freedom um, is nothing, does not work. I don't have the potency of doing that. So the modern soul has been taken between a sort of, uh, a, of um, a, a hysterical a desire of freedom that has fueled aggressiveness, imperialism, fascism, machismo, and so on and so on. Uh, I am free of doing whatever I, I want. If you don't like, I kill you. I rape you. Uh, but uh, we have not really, I mean, the modern thought has not been able to, to elaborate the relation between uh, freedom and potency, I am free to do what I have the potency to do. And potency is not happening individually. Potency is a social construction 
is the construction of the condition of freedom. This is why I think that uh, the United States of America is dead. I think that the political entity called the United States of America has, uh, has reached the point of no return. At the point uh, uh, Trump has been a sort of declaration of impotent on impotence of the American people, declaring uh, that we are free to do whatever you want means uh, that uh, we are allowed to destroy whatever is uh, uh, um, impeaching uh, my, my freedom. At the end, Trump has been defeated. Yes, I know. But what is happening now? That's the point. I mean, I I trust Biden. I see that he is but he is promising interesting things. He is promising that he will close private uh, jails, for instance. I I am happy of listening to to this. Um, but uh, I trust his uh, his goodwill. But the problem is that the goodwill may be. Biden has converted to socialism. I hope so. Uh, the problem is that his goodwill is not enough because the problem now is deconstructing the effects of two centuries of systematic racism, systematic violence, systematic misunderstanding of the concept of freedom. This kind of mistaken freedom and violence and suprematism and, and so on. So what you said before is questioning the problem of subjectivity. It's our subjectivity that now is the real problem. What's happening to social subjectivity? What's happening to social solidarity? What's happening to the social body, the erotic body of society? So I, I have engaged in, 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 a, in, in, in a research about this point. And um, I, I did a sort of an inquiry, an investigation, or can I say, a, a small investigation. I sent a, a how do you say, a questionnaire, a, a, some questions to my friends, to young friends, students, people that I don't know, people that I know, young people in their 20s, in their 30s, <coughs> asking them very basic questions like, uh, would you kiss an unknown person that you like very much and who is like you very much, uh, but uh, you meet in the street? Would you, would you accept a, a, a physical contact with, uh, with the unknown? Or questions like, uh, how do you imagine, what do you imagine of your life in the next five years and so on. Um, so now I am trying to analyze the, the, the answers. Uh, I am writing something about that because my point is, will we be able to kiss each other again? And you say kiss, uh, what? strange problem for an old person like me. Yeah, I know. But I remember that the Ministry of Health of Canada, not, not really the ministry, the, the main person of the health system of Canada two months ago, in September actually, said in a, in a public declaration, she said, skip kisses. In the case you have sexual relations, uh, don't forget uh, to wear a sanitary mask uh, 
And in any case, in the present situation, the best is going solo. Um, I don't blame that lady uh, for this. She, she told something that was, I mean, she was obliged uh, to say that. And she, I understand. I understand it's not my problem. I don't want to, to look like an irresponsible uh, defensor of uh, freedom uh, in the fascist sense of the world. No, no, not at all. But I wonder, I, I am thinking, uh, what's going to happen to people 20 years old, 15 years old, young, very young people who are told, uh, skip kisses. What's going to happen in their mind? What's going to happen in their body, in their, in their, in their sexual expectations? And when I say sexual expectations, I am talking of the condition for social solidarity. Social solidarity is not based on ideals. It's based on the pleasure of being together. What's happening to the pleasure of being together, to the new generation of humans? That is my political question, political. But I do want to go back to your, your survey um, because I was, I was really, um, I mean, it's problematic and, and, it, and it's difficult to think about political subjectivity through sexual subjectivity, you know. But you also um, see something very interesting. Um, a short thing, that contagion uh, has forced us to put desire uh, to second place, or even third, fourth, fifth place. Um, and I think that's a valid point. But the interesting and the scary part is that you say, this is not good conditions for building autonomy. So on the one hand, I totally agree with you. On the other hand, I also might ask you to problematize this, because I have seen through the insurrections over the summer. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, admitting any involvement with anything on uh, the air, but I have witnessed uh, street medics uh, learning. I mean, especially in places like Portland and Seattle, but in New York, we are learning how to take care of each other. At every um, uh, demonstration I went to, there were queer people, there were trans people, there were people of color, there were socialists, and they were all handing out food, handing out masks, taking care of each other, typically at a distance. So on the one hand, yes, the desire uh, being put behind uh, certainly um, stops some creation of autonomy. But I wonder whether you think it also creates conditions for other forms of autonomy. What do you think? I don't want to look uh, dogmatic, a dogmatic Guattaria Deleuzian. I'm not a dogmatic. I am Guattaria Deleuzian, but not dogmatic. And it's impossible to be dogmatic <laughs> in, in, in the field of Deleuzian thought. Uh, but I think that it is not uh, one thing among others. Desire is uh, the, the condition for sharing a project. Uh, what, what is the meaning of the word desire? That is important. Huh? Desire is not... Uh, is not uh, sexual drive it's much more it's much more rich desire is the tendency to creation desire is the coming out of a, a, a project a project is based on this tending towards the world. The creation of, of the social world is essentially a problem of sharing the same desire. Before I said strategy, we need a strategy 
but strategy. We can think a strategic thought when we share the same uh, tendency, the same going to the same drive, the same desire. So my when I when I uh, um, emphasize so much the problem of uh, erotic uh, approachability, of uh, erotic uh, uh, of the erotic dimension of being together. I mean society the. The only thing that we really possess is the ability to produce a flow of desire that is changing the mind of the majority of society. We have nothing. We have no money. We have no media. We have uh, no weapons. Uh, we have no political power. Sometimes, notwithstanding this having nothing, sometimes we have been able to create a social movement, to create a transformation, to win. If I can use this horrible word that means nothing. Uh, and why? So if we have nothing, what do we have? We have the ability to suscitate, to stimulate a common desire. This is, uh, in my personal experience, my small political experience. Uh, if I remember what happened in the, in the 70s in Italy, we had nothing, but all of a sudden, we had the ability to say words, to make gestures, to suggest possibilities that uh, stimulated a majority and a very uh, large flow of common desire. This is why I, I say it's important, enormously important, to understand what happens in the social unconscious. Um, I, when I, I use the expression social unconscious, I know that it's, uh, it's impervious to use. Uh, I don't even know if the social unconscious exists. I know that uh, 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 the social brain has a, a dimension that is not reducible to rational uh, thought. Imagination. What is imagination? Imagination is the ability to uh, mentally create something that is not yet existing. Remark that I said yet existing. Imagination is the ability to recombine what we know according to a different design, to a different combination. So imagination is essentially recombination of what we know in such a way that we create something that is not yet known. But what is the fuel of imagination? Is desire, desire of being together with that person, desire of sharing the same social environment, desire of having adventures, adventures that are um, impossible. If I am obliged to be a salaried worker uh, inside, uh, uh, so you see, this is why I think that uh, the problem of desire and imagination is the only condition that we have to, to have potency. And so, to have freedom. There is no freedom without potency, and there is no potency without desire.
that's actually one of the reasons why your survey and the text you sent me with responses to your survey is so nice. I mean, you said it's you felt distance from people and you wanted to feed your brain with other people's thoughts. I think that's that's very nice. And that's a form of collectivity that is emerging, not or I shouldn't say because of, but in spite of these various forms of distanciation and, and alienation that you're describing. And this recombination, it could take a lot of different forms. And I, I do want to talk about that. Um, and you, you mentioned that uh, we, again, let's just say you and me, we, no media, no weapons, no money. At the same time, uh, I mean, speaking as somebody who was involved with Radio Alicia, the pirate radio station in Bologna, and speaking in a place like Museo del Chopo that uh, you know, was involved with uh, the punk community who organized their own pirate radio station at this legendary street market in Mexico City um, that I'm not going to mispronounce. Um, but uh, there is also some form of freedom and again, desire in the way that you're describing it that comes from the creation of the possibility to make our media. And yes, from the possibility of arming ourselves if, if, if so necessary, or the possibility of breaking GameStop, you know, without allying with uh, homophobic fascists who are on, you know, those uh, threads on the internet uh, that produced uh, that stuff. But yeah, can you talk a little bit about the possibility for creating our own media, the possibility for um, finding collectivity and desire in uh, taking control of uh, telling history? Yeah. You know, that, that, that's, that is a, a, a crucial point. Yes, I said that we have no money, no weapons, and no media. And um, I don't know if I want to call it a medium. Um, was Radio Alice a medium? Yes and not. Um, a medium, uh, in a sense, uh, is a a, a tool, a technology that makes possible the passage of a, a content, of a message if you want, and is also producing the message itself uh, in a certain way. Um, Radio Alice was a sort of surfing the media, was a an attempt to be in the field of media, but with the intention that for some days, some months became a, a winning intention, became a reality of uh, give of uh, of dissolving the instrumentality of the medium itself. But let's uh, forget about Radio Alice that is so far in time. There is another experience, which is much more uh, 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 next, uh, much more close, less distance in time. In the media, in the media, is almost forgotten in the memory of the movements, but uh, it was. A, an extraordinary experience of self-organization. I remember those that experience because I was involved in the in the creation of the media uh, since the beginning, and um, and um, it was uh, what was in the media. Maybe that young people don't even know what it was in the media was. Uh, Facebook before Facebook, uh, was Twitter before Twitter, uh, and uh, it was a, a, a sort of network of concatenation of small groups of activists uh, living in every part of the world, in India, in Italy, in the United States, in Mexico, everywhere, in every city. There was a group of people who were making information about their own situation, but at the same time had the possibility of exchanging daily information and words with 
of people. In the media was important in the years of Seattle, in the years of Genova, in the years of the so-called no global movement, which was much more, much more the contrary. It was the, the global movement of anti-capitalist uh, uh, people uh, in, in the world. And in the media was a condition for exchanging local information in a network that what was emphasizing the global meaning. What was the meaning of in the media? It's important to, 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 to recall the, the, the meaning of the no global movement. We were saying, beware. If the neoliberal form uh, uh, of capitalism uh, um, is able to dominate our future, we are going to, uh, to lose uh, democracy, we are going to lose uh, uh, the possibility of deciding about our own life. We are going to lose everything. 20 years ago, there was a global movement saying, stop with capitalism because capitalism is destroying our life. Well, 20 years after, the nose is tightening around our neck. Why in the media has disappeared at a certain point? Well, I must remember that in the year 2001, the, the, the uh, cupola, how do you say, the, the, the head of global capitalism met in an Italian city called Genova. In July 2001, the eight powers of the world, uh, eight killers like George Bush, like Vladimir Putin, and like Silvio Berlusconi, met in the city of Genova. And they decided the movement was demonstrating in the streets and uh, uh, protesting against this kind of takeover of democracy by the, 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 the G8. And the Italian state, supported by the American uh, Secret Service, killed one demonstrator and aggressed a demonstration of 300,000 people. That was a moment of total uh, aggression and violence. Then they entered the, cent the media center of the movement, uh, which was in a school, in an elementary school of the city of Genova. They destroyed the, the the tools of the media center. They arrested hundreds of people who were there. They brought them in a barrack in the, in the outskirts of Genova and they tortured people all the night long. Torture was back in the democratic uh, state of Italy. This is a story that we should recount every day because it was the moment of a fascist aggression of the neoliberal state against peaceful demonstrators in, in, in the streets. The day after, in the media was dead because the people who were uh, animating the network were uh, alarmed, unable to react uh, to such a violence. The only, I remember the discussion that we had in those days, uh, and we say to each other, we can react to this violence only when we have weapons to fight against those weapons. We cannot, uh, you see, but uh, now 
the problem of in the media is back. We now need to withdraw from the domination of Facebook. I am ashamed of being a subscriber of Facebook. I am inside the mach that machine. My face is one of the two, two billion faces of Facebook. Why am I obliged to do that? Because I know that I have no tools, no voice, nothing. So if I want to say a word to my friends, I am obliged to, to use uh, Facebook. Why so? Why? Because we have been unable in the last 20 years to create a space for autonomous communication. I think that the American movement, which in this moment is the world avant-garde of the movement, should work in this direction together with our comrades and friends who are working inside Facebook, inside Google, because the, the thousands of people who are creating a union inside Google, the thousands of, of Facebook workers who are exploited by Mark Zuckerberg, those people can create from inside the new medium that you need more than ever. So it is a, I, I think we should launch a claim, an appeal, a, a call, call to the creation of the autonomous media of free thinkers from the inside, inside the machine itself. Let's talk a bit about uh, the social body. The social body. Oh, uh, yeah. I wanted to talk about what I'm seeing in, in New York City. And I'll give one example. One example is a, a group that uh, I like to talk about a lot called Woodbine, where you've, you've spoken. Uh, it's a cultural autonomous hub in Ridgewood, Queens, in a working class, mostly immigrant neighborhood. Uh, they founded kind of uh, in the years after Occupy, uh, sort of very much an anti a space coming out a decade later from the anti-globalization movement that you were describing, uh, even though many of the folks are much younger. But at the beginning of the pandemic, they shifted their space from being a space of lectures and uh, dinners and uh, conferences and screenings to a food pantry. And at this point, they're feeding about 3,000 families a week sometimes, completely autonomously, completely unaffiliated with the state or any charity formations. Um, and I, I think this is an interesting example to bring up because there has been an absolute, uh, at least from my mind, and maybe this is just because I wasn't paying enough attention before, but there has been an explosion, a proliferation of magazines, zines, pamphlets, uh, stickers, uh, propaganda, uh, food distribution. Things have been trading hands throughout the pandemic, throughout the insurrections. And I wonder if you consider this, given that you played an integral part in a very important, uh, for lack of a better word, counterculture. I don't know if you would use that word. But talking about indie media, do you think that the, we are seeing a resurgence of, uh, of a counterculture that is, that is more interested in being autonomous? Um, how would you talk about uh, this? Well, you know, the very expression counterculture um, is difficult to interpret now nowadays. I mean, what exactly is a counterculture? Is it uh, a phenomenon that uh, happens uh, uh, outside of the existing media scape? Um, or is it a sort of uh, um, permanent uh, contradiction uh, transforming the mediascape uh, from the inside. Um, if we think what country culture was in the 60s and in the 70s, um, it, it, actually, in that time, counterculture is a, was essentially 
a, a phenomenon separated and opposed to the dominant culture and the dominant media. But uh, this is the, the reason was exactly to, in order to to uh, name again the Cognitarian force, the reason was that uh, um, the, the sphere, the infosphere, the media sphere was, uh, was separated from social labor. Uh, it was essentially something that uh, um, was the, the, the projection of professionals uh, with no relation with uh, with uh, with uh, social work now now i think that counterculture has to be something that uh, infiltrates the media scape uh, actually the the, the experience of in the media has been an experience of infiltration also. And, and I, I mean, actually, I, I see that experience like Woodbine uh, are at the place, at the dimension in which uh, new projects can uh, can be uh, can 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 be created but um, we should not accept the limitation of uh, being outside of being uh, in a in a, in a, uh, in a totally external dimension i think that uh, this is the the mistake the error that we made in the in the 80s if i remember after the experience of radio alice and of the autonomous media in italy in germany uh, in germany very much in germany the autonomous uh, uh, communication was important in the 70s then we mistook radicalism with a sort of uh, um, refusal to infiltrate uh, and uh, that was a mistake because we stayed outside the media transformation and we uh, we have been unable for instance to to to, to counter to sabotage from the inside the experience of Berlusconi. You know, Berlusconi would never been so strong without the previous experience of the free radios in Italy. And the, the, the workers who worked in, in, the, in the corporation of Berlusconi were people, were my friends, people coming out from our autonomous, that was a, our mistake, our inability to think the possibility of creating a sort of counter television inside the, the, the sphere of, uh, um, of dominant media. That sabotage and autonomy cannot be separated. And if you want to be a, a successful saboteur, you have to be very closed to the machine. If you want to, to destroy the machine, you have to be able to infiltrate. I think that in the 70s, we finally have lost have missed the possibility of being simultaneously autonomy and sabotage in the future if we have 
the force and the ability to put together those precarious workers who are suffering because of capitalist exploitation, we have to be able to transform them into sabotage workers and autonomous human beings. It's so difficult to speak of this subject today. You know why? It's so difficult because I feel that we have a, an enormous, when I say we, I mean those people who won't get free from capitalist exploitation. Mm? Um, and we have an enormous strength that is uh, a, in our social condition and an enormous weakness that is in our psychological condition. You see, its subjectivity is in danger, is weak nowadays. But if we are able to create a small machine for the multiplication of desire, for the viral proliferation of a desiring uh, uh, project, of a project of equality, of frugality, of pleasure. If we can create this small machine, that may be the beginning of a process uh, of total sabotage and transformation of the machine of power. In the post-68 moment, the idea was get the fuck out. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can say that. The idea was to get out, you know? Uh, and in the 80s, the idea was, ah, let us subvert, let us enter. And, and both those techniques, if uncoupled from a genuine understanding of the terrain that the institution sketches, right, uh, fails. Because if you exit, you are still inside the system, just different way. And if you enter, uh, you will be recuperated. Your technique will be taken. And something that I found very interesting um, is in, in recent movements that have taken the museum uh, as a site of contestation, specifically the Whitney Museum in, in, in New York City in, uh, in, um, two years ago, was that they were both inside and outside. So they went in inside the museum to protest, but they had uh, anti-jail groups, uh, anti-gentrification groups, anti-police groups, creating a citywide network. So you're both inside and outside. And maybe you don't believe uh, the idea of autonomy, aesthetic autonomy that the museum says exists. You don't believe it, but you pretend like you do because you can come in there and the police won't beat you up so quickly and you have a space to work. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, last question. We're, in, we're uh, in a museum, virtually. We're at the Museo del Choco. Uh, we're speaking about counterculture. We're speaking about art and cultural workers investing in social struggles. How do you think today, given your, your history of involvement in various movements, how do you think today artists, cultural workers, specific, this, this other group of social subjectivity that we haven't discussed so much, how can they relate to revolutionary activity, resistance? And I think the, I, the notion that was uh, proposed to us with this talk was dissent. So what is the place of culture producers in creating or disseminating dissent? The first step now is uh, a sort of, uh, for me, for me personally, the first step is, has been and is, uh, to, to try to, uh, to reactivate my antennas, my, my sensitive, sensible antennas. I've been alone for 10 months now. Uh, it's the first time in my life. I have always been a very sociable person. I've been teaching all my life. I have been... 
uh, going into social centers, meeting young persons, and all of a sudden I am alone. And uh, so I, I tried to reactivate my antennas with uh, this act of uh, investigation. But I'm not sure that the results, uh, the outcome of this uh, investigation has been so, so happy. I'm a little bit depressed, frankly, speaking of uh, the results of my investigation, but it has been a way to start uh, a, a, a talk with young friends about their desire and my desire about their suffering and my suffering and so on. I think that the first action that we should uh, start as artists, as intellectuals and as activists is a sort of investigations on mental suffering. We have not spoken in these two hours, we have not spoken of the psychological collapse that is underway. It is not only an effect of the pandemic. It's an, first, it's an effect of capitalist competition, of precarious uh, condition. Then it's an effect of the pandemic isolation. So our first task is speaking with people, you know, very close, with or without sanitary mask, and ask them, do you think that in your life there will be a possibility of happiness, of friendship, of pleasure, if we don't come out from the capitalist hell? That is the first act that we have to do, I think. Thank you.